The Mystic Path to Cosmic Power by Vernon Howard. Chapter 9. The Sure Cure for Fear and Tension. I think I could tackle my problem more wisely if I could see what it is. Isn't it strange that I don't know what's bothering me? I used to think I understood but no longer. Do you have insight into this? Do you know what my problem is? Yes, I know. Will you point it out? If you are deeply interested in the exploration, it is a psychological law that no one can be given anything that they don't really want. Do you want a thorough discussion? Yes. I somehow sense that this is the only way. So tell me please, what is my basic difficulty? You are afraid. Afraid? Really? Fear is always a dominating difficulty of anyone separated from his original nature. Just as thorns are natural to a cactus, so are fear and anxiety a part of the false self. But there is bright hope here. Do you see it? By recovering our natural self we lose our fears. Is that what you mean? Yes. Anxiety becomes impossible. That's what I want. So please, I'd like to explore it. That is what we will do in this chapter. Everyone treading the mystic path must slay the dragons of fear, both the surface shakings and the deeper dreads. Fear is not only a terrible foe in itself, but leads to other negativities, such as anger, which Confucius described as a foremost self-destroyer. The very root of fear is a false sense of identity. All other negative states like worry and restlessness grow from this, just as sour apples spring from an unhealthy tree. Man wrongly assumes that he is his name, or body, or possessions. Because of this, he fearfully fights through life trying to prove that he is these things. This is utterly futile, as men sadly discover every day. Because they don't see the alternative, they continue the vain struggle. And so you see millions of people acting gaily, but their eyes tell quite another story. Living from this false sense of identity creates thousands of fearful and self-damaging ideas toward life. For instance, there is no more dangerous nor frustrating doctrine than that you ought to live according to the dictates of a confused society. You ought to do nothing of the sort. In fact, the only real life you have is that which springs spontaneously from your own spiritual nature. When this life is achieved, we are no longer mechanical robots, but noble human beings who live as we really want to live. No longer do we march dully to the blaring bands of an authoritarian society, but we dance gaily to the music swelling up from our original being. In that free state, we are unafraid of anything or anyone, anything or anyone. The Tremendous Discovery of Socrates one deeply rooted anxiety that must be abolished has been expressed in the phrase, but what will happen to me tomorrow? People strain over their future finances, friendships, health, just about everything. They hope they will improve, or at least not worsen. But the hope is fearful, for they sense their lack of control over the future, away with all this self-torture. I tell you truly that you need not have the slightest concern with tomorrow. All is well. Even if you do not realize it, the fact remains. But you must not try to feel this fact, for your emotions will fool you. Without involving your feelings, simply see the fact that all is well. By doing this, you create the legitimate and abiding feeling of assurance. The right order is to place fact before feeling. Perhaps someone asks, but does all this apply to me as an individual? Can I personally know the answers? You can? You can certainly establish yourself upon the unshakable rock of your true self. Yes, of course, the answers come to the man or woman who inquires with this kind of earnestness. I would rather have trustworthy and satisfying answers to these questions than all the gold of the Indies. To know, not to believe, not to hope, not to have faith, but to know that the universe is friendly, that our feet are set on an intelligent pilgrimage, and there is love at the heart of things. This is knowledge for which I am still questing, and for which I would gladly barter, as for the pearl of great price, all other knowledge. It is helpful to see that those who attain the lofty life have the same experiences. The mystic path presents the same challenges, and rich rewards to all. Everyone meets baffling questions which seem unanswerable. Discouragement and a sense of futility are common to all, but all who persist arrive. Let's examine the experiences of two enlightened men. 
These serve as heartening examples. When Socrates reached his 40th year, his perplexities about himself reached their peak. What is life all about? What is really worthwhile? Who is this person called Socrates? Is there another way to live? Socrates put his questions to men who supposedly knew the answers, the educators, philosophers, politicians, men of skill, and men in authority. Their muddled replies proved that they were just as ignorant as he. But there was a difference. Socrates knew he was ignorant, while they, in their human conceit, perfectly believed in the mythical self-pictures they had of themselves as wise counsellors. So Socrates resolutely set out to do what every psychic explorer must do, seek the truth for himself, within himself. Seeking, he found. He came up with the declaration, the unexamined life is not worth living. Compare Socrates' quest with that of Count Tolstoy's in chapter 2. Notice how their intense inner integrity compelled them to see through the shallow authorities of the day and to plunge into the mystery for themselves. Though widely separated by centuries, Socrates and Tolstoy reached the same tremendous conclusion. To find yourself, think for yourself. The strange truth about results. I'm both fascinated and baffled by something you said the other night. You said we must learn to be completely unconcerned with the results of our social and business efforts. Of all the mystical principles you have given us, this is the hardest to grasp. The inquirer is right. While it takes intensive study, no mystical truth offers more enrichment. It is vital that we do not misunderstand, so let's explore carefully. Learn to be indifferent to the results of your efforts in the human affairs of money-making, friendships, career, and so forth. Notice the tormenting worry over results. Will the new friends like us? Can I make the sale? Will my marriage be happy? Can I succeed at this? Concern with results is a major torture to man. Moreover, it is the very thing that unconsciously causes failure. Meet both so-called good results and so-called bad results with quiet indifference. Neither makes any difference as far as your personal happiness is concerned. We demand a financial success or a social gain because we think it will fulfill us inwardly. It won't. It never will, as we have suspected all along. So-called success provides ego excitement, but never self-fulfillment. It is just as impossible for an exterior result to provide inner happiness as it is for a new hat to give us a new mind. A man may object, but what do I have to live for, if not for exciting results? The mystic replies, for abiding happiness. I know. This principle goes against everything we have been taught. All of us are conditioned from birth to insist, expect, demand, and be anxious. Yes, this is the human way, but we are tired of it. We are on the esoteric path where everything is different. The difference is the gift of cheery abandonment for which we have always yearned. When we don't have an ego-centered demand for a particular result, we remain light-hearted, whether the outcome is so-called good or so-called bad. The free man dwells above human good and bad. He floats in a higher good. Not that we are careless in our human affairs, far from it. We are much more skillful in running our daily tasks. This freedom clears the mind, turns emotions into allies. See chapter 10 for more details on this idea. Think of some plan that you desperately want to succeed. Now ask yourself, how would I feel if I didn't care how it turned out? See, your peace is assured, regardless of results. That is what we are getting at. I am a practical business executive. I don't see how I can be indifferent to results in the arena of dollars and cents. This particular idea somehow eludes me. Let's put it this way. Be just as active as you like in your business, but do it to earn your living, never for ego gratification. Try to see the difference in the two. I guarantee that you will never again have a business headache, not even when severe problems arise. The situation may be confused, but you are not. Let cosmic principles work for you. I'd like that. Will you please summarize? Intelligently work for this or that goal in your daily affairs, but give up all concern for results. Let whatever wants to happen go ahead and happen. You keep your peace when you don't demand a certain result. 
For example, that the customer should buy your product or that this person should appreciate you. Set up no demands for anything from anyone. Grasp this tremendous principle and your life will never again be the same. You, the reader, can start right now. Try it in small matters at first. Do what you like, but leave results entirely to themselves. Call it an outcome, but do not label it as either a good or bad outcome. By doing this, you work in harmony with mysterious and powerful cosmic principles. Now, let's discover a practical procedure for effective work. Over the years, I have found it a valuable practice to select a basic principle, reduce it to a single sentence, and reflect on it for several days. We do this in our Mystic Path study groups here in Los Angeles. You can do likewise with any of the hundreds of ideas in this book. Select one that attracts you in particular and work with it. Let's select three mystical principles and see how our reflections might go. Principle. The mystic path calls for courage and persistence. My reflection. I work daily to become a stronger and more self-aware person. I will be neither surprised nor afraid if and when my present world of beliefs and opinions comes tumbling down. This is both good and necessary. Now on the cleared space, I can build a new self made of wisdom and quietude. Principle. Man is asleep, but can awaken. My reflection. Man suffers because he does not see the true nature of things. So great is his sleep hypnosis that he doesn't even suspect that he sees everything through the screen of his own false assumptions. But man can wake up. All can be changed. There is another world. Through willingness to surrender the ego self, not through strength or wisdom, but through willingness, he can break free into spontaneous living. Principle. We must constantly seek a clear self-understanding. My reflection. Self-clarity comes first. Unless I am clear within myself, I cannot prevent problems from arising, nor can I dismiss them. I must wash away confusing emotions like depression and self-pity, which make self-clarity impossible. How can we see things clearly when our eyes are full of tears? The Winning Way One permanent enrichment given by universal principles is a flexibility that enables us to meet and handle any situation. If it is an unwanted habit, it falls away. If it is a family crisis, we remain in calm command. A person living from his false self cannot do this. He reacts rigidly and mechanically to everything. He has no choice. He must obey the tyrannical dictates of the artificial self, which leads to distress and disaster. This explains the repeated failure of the person who vows not to lose his temper anymore and to be nicer to others. The false self cannot be anything but negative. It is foolish to be surprised when the fig tree produces figs. Marcus Aurelius A rigid man is like a lecturer who writes out ten speeches but is satisfied only with the last one. Since he carelessly carries the nine jumbled versions with him as he faces his audience, he fumbles around, reads the wrong notes, forgets what he wants to say and so on. He is embarrassed and distressed all because he is still connected with the faulty material of the past. Yet he can use his intelligence so that this won't happen again. He can toss out the wrong notes. Then he can speak accurately and easily. So can we, by dismissing the false ideas we have collected over the years, be free and flexible. One useless idea is that a mere discussion of our faults, that is merely talking about them, does any good. Self-confession must be accompanied by self-insight. Without insight, talk becomes an endless procession of wrongdoing and confession, misbehaving and admitting. Genuine confession represents an honest breakthrough into ourselves. When that happens, there is less and less of wrongdoing and, quite naturally, less pain in the form of reactions. The New Testament term metanoia, sometimes translated as repentance, means change of mind. That is what we gain as we see into ourselves. We experience genuine change of mind, a new kind of mind, one that is flexible, wise, unafraid, one capable of serving our true interests. Another false notion to dismiss is that we are threatened by our past follies. Listen, once we determine to find ourselves, past experiences turn to profit. This includes everything unhappy, sinful, shameful, childish, impulsive, regretful. How? One way to know this is by contrasting what we used to be and what we are changing into. 
Nothing is more encouraging than to see ourselves actually changing our very nature. In addition, past events help us to see a basic lesson of the mystic path. Human folly is done while in a state of non-awareness, of psychic hypnosis. This encourages us to become more awake, for we see that wakefulness is the true and only answer to human folly. Finally, we see that we can become entirely free of guilt and shame stemming from past behavior. We realize that it was not done by the true self, but by the artificial self, which is now fading out. Who needs a candle in the sunlight? Fear has no power whatsoever. Fear towards something gives that something false power over you. The chains which appear to enslave us are made of paper. That is what we must see. For example, the question comes, you often repeat that we must see things as they really are, not as we imagine them. May we have an example of this from everyday life? Take a man in middle age or older who suddenly sees that his business affairs have failed or are only mediocre. His friends are much more successful or are already retired on comfortable pensions. The thought fills him with despair. He feels cheated. That man could change everything in a wink. He need only see things as they are in reality. That is, it makes no difference whatsoever to his own happiness whether he succeeds or not. It never did make any difference, but he is still hypnotized by deluded society with all its stupid praise of what it calls success. Incidentally, that man's more successful friends are not nearly as happy as they pretend. To destroy the false power of fear, a man can start with his human relationships. He can break the paper chains looped around him by society. He can refuse to cringe before the cruel and the domineering and daringly pursue his true individuality. If Ralph Waldo Emerson had not penned anything but the following, he would have left mankind with a resounding battle cry of freedom. Society everywhere is in conspiracy against the manhood of every one of its members. Self-reliance is its aversion. It loves not realities and creators but names and customs. He who would gather immortal palms must not be hindered by the name of goodness, but must explore if it be goodness. Nothing is at last sacred but the integrity of your own mind. Self-reliance. We might add, nothing is at last noble but a human being whose mind is free of fear. There is a particular area of social relation that is seldom discussed as it needs to be. I'm speaking of the fear that people have toward each other. Will you comment on this? You must never inwardly consent to a fear relationship with another person. Even if you must live with him or her, you must refuse to be afraid. The techniques of the mystic path will help you detach yourself. What do you mean by a fear relationship? Where you are not fully at ease. There can be no love or understanding if you are uneasy toward another. It is necessary that you become aware of your anxiety toward him or her. This leads to other insights which gradually set you free. Why are we afraid of others? Because we want something from them. The desire can be almost anything. Companionship, approval, sex, security. The mistake is this. Not having found the true self which is free from compulsive desires, we seek gratification from people. This creates fear that we won't get what we want, or anxiety that the other person will make us pay dearly for it. All this is terrible torture which you must refuse to endure any longer. With your new insight, all your human relationships are carefree. The Unusual George Gurdjieff Let's meet a modem mystic with some uniquely exciting ideas about escape from psychic prison, George Gurdjieff. Though his early life is veiled in mystery, Gurdjieff was probably born in Alexandropal in Asia Minor, about 1872. This remarkable and often controversial man spent a dozen years roaming about the East in search of esoteric teachings. He returned with a tremendous wealth of wisdom for the Western world. Gurdjieff summarized the problem. Mankind is asleep, but doesn't know it. So deep is his hypnotic slumber that he does his daily walking and talking, his legislating and marrying in a state of unconsciousness. Actually, the acts are the mechanical acts of hypnotized people. And that, Gurdjieff declares, is the simple reason why the world goes from one disaster to another. Would, he asks, a conscious human being destroy himself through war and crime and quarrels? No, man simply knows not what he does to himself. 
Hopeless? Not at all. Gurdjieff has supreme optimism. It is the only worthwhile kind of optimism, that based on a personal experience of liberation. You can, he announces, wake up. You can turn from a mechanical man into a true individualist who runs his own life. Yes, while here on earth you can be a perfectly conscious and happy person. Love, intelligence, peace will no longer be mere words or theories. They will be vow. How? Just be honest with yourself. That opens the door. Try to see the difference between the person you imagine you are and how you actually are. Oh, it might shock a bit at first, but never mind. You are doing what the mass of men never dare to do. Start the process of inner change of being. One day during World War I, Gurdjieff and a newspaper reporter named P.D. Uspensky met in a small cafe to talk things over. It was a momentous meeting of two great minds. Uspensky became Gurdjieff's chief disciple and reporter. Between the two of them, an intriguing and practical system for self-awakening came forth. One of their basic principles explains the many and varied eyes in a man. The unawakened man is not a unified person. He has dozens of selves within him, each falsely calling itself I. Many philosophers, including George Santayana and David Hume, have also observed how a person switches constantly from one eye to another, but Gurdjieff and Uspensky spoke with the most clarity on the subject. The many eyes within a man explains many mysteries about human nature. For example, a man decides to give up an undesirable habit, but the next day he repeats it again. Why? Because another eye has taken over, one that likes the habit and has no intention of giving it up. Or perhaps a woman decides to quit fooling around with her life. She determines to find her real self. She reads a book or two and goes to a few lectures. Then suddenly she loses all interest and goes back to her self-defeating behavior. What happened? An entirely different I, one that doesn't want her to wake up, took charge. Gurdjieff provides a simple solution to this contradictory condition. Become aware of the many eyes. Watch how one takes over and then another. Also, see that they do not represent the true you but consist of borrowed opinions and imitated viewpoints. Such self-observation weakens their grip. You eventually find your real I. That is the new birth proclaimed by esoteric Christianity. Give special attention to this idea. Let's see how anxiety connects with a particular desire within a man. The desire for excitement, thrills, emotional sensations. The greater an individual's enslavement to thrills, the more he suffers from an unsatisfying and unstable life. Unhealthy desires can never be satisfied. They are a bottomless basket. We escape our compulsive appetites only when we see them as such. It is a sure sign of escape from the psychic torture chamber when we feel less and less compelled to seek artificial stimulations. In your practice of self-observation, notice how uncomfortable it is to be without excitement to have nothing happening. Notice how you are always doing something in order to keep the mind and body in motion. We are afraid of coming to a stop, of being empty, of not feeling anything. This fear is based on the illusion that without these excitements, we would cease to exist. We cannot imagine who we would be if we did not identify ourselves with agitation. Yes, we actually fear that we would cease to exist. And this is right the counterfeit self would cease to exist, which is the very thing that gives you genuine existence, real joy, permanent peace. What to do? Refuse to accept emotional excitement as happiness. It is not happiness. It is emotional excitement. It is a counterfeit that betrays you. High emotional flights must always crash. No, do not think that lack of artificial stimulation means boredom. It means the exact opposite. If only you will work to see this. Boredom is the crash from the high flight. This freedom means the fading of boredom and the appearance of authentic inspiration. I know that this point bothers a lot of people. It is frequently mentioned at my lectures, so I want to repeat. Do not assume that the abandonment of invented thrills will take all the fun out of life. It puts lasting fun into your life, maybe for the very first time. If you really mean business, you are in for the time of your life. You are embarking upon the greatest adventure any man has ever experienced. Real excitement? 
You have no idea how exciting it is to observe the gradual but definite appearance of your real self. Watch narrowly the demonstration of a truth, its birth, and you trace back the effluence to its spring and source within us, where broods radiance vast. Robert Browning, Paracelsus. The only enduring thrill comes with the awakening of our intuitive self. Nothing else ever has or ever will satisfy. We need only examine our present lives to see that this is so. We always pay a dreadful price when we try to induce feelings of aliveness through ego-directed activities. We are not speaking, of course, of the normal pleasures of good company or interesting recreation. These are both necessary and legitimate. The point is, we can never really enjoy normal recreations unless we have first awakened to ourselves. The awakened man or woman never falls back into depression when the gay party comes to an end. He goes home with tranquility, not with loneliness. Can you be without noise and stimulation and not be afraid? Can you be inwardly still, without demanding a distraction from the strange stillness? If so, the fearsome silence turns magically into the peaceful harbour you have been seeking all your life. The Peaceful Valley Recall a vital point for making swift progress. We must read and hear these principles with our intuitive self, not with our rigid intellect. Reading mystical facts with a conditioned mind is like reading a sentence backward. We get words, but no meaning. Meaning comes from within, and meaning is within everyone, including you, the reader. There is a momentous mystical truth which relieves you of all anxiety. You are not your conditioned thoughts. Do you see the significance of this? Stop and consider. You are tense over a family crisis. Where is the tension? The only place it can be, within your own mind. You are exhausted over a financial problem. Look now, where did the tiredness originate? Not in the problem itself, but within your own anxious thoughts toward it. Do not identify with your thoughts. Do not think you are your anxious thoughts. You are not. You are entirely separate. See your thoughts as a passing stream which you merely observe. Don't jump into that stream and get carried away. We must reach the place where we actually see that we don't know what we are doing with our lives. We must recognize that we don't know where we are going, and never have. This must be done without anxiety and without emotion, just as we might recognize that we took a wrong turn on the highway. We must see that our human opinions are worthless. They can do nothing for us. When this happens, we are on the edge of a monumental discovery. But shouldn't we have our personal opinions about who we are and where we are going? Why should you have opinions about anything whatsoever? Why not seek the facts? Opinions and theories are like riding a merry-go-round. You have an illusion that you are going somewhere. People adopt opinions in an attempt to feel secure, but they provide nothing but nervousness. Instead of covering up human shakiness with a shallow theory, why not let the facts expose and destroy it? How do we find facts? Dare to live without opinions? At first you feel jittery, like an invalid abandoning his cane, but later quietness sets in. The test of whether you really see a fact about life is this. When clearly seen, you feel a great sense of relief. It is as if a party of travellers in a stormy country decides to scale a high mountain to see whether the other side has a peaceful valley. Each man, in turn, tries to climb to the peak, but failing, supplies his pet theory for failure. One pessimistic hiker guesses that it is probably just as stormy on the other side. A scholar with lots of book knowledge delivers a long and boring lecture, which says nothing. The third man lazily sits back and gullibly swallows anything the others say. But a fourth traveller is practical. He has no use for mere theories. He wants to find out for himself, so he courageously climbs all the way to the top. His reward is the fact itself there is a peaceful valley on the other side. Chapter Summary of Successful Ideas 1. Fear is totally unnecessary. 2. As we dissolve fear, we live as we really want to live. 3. The only solution to inner tension is contact with the inner self. 4. Let no one think for you, think for yourself always. 5. Have no concern whatsoever for results. 6. As outlined let cosmic principles work for you. 7. Fear has no power at all, see this for yourself by refusing a fear relationship with anyone. 8. It is impossible for a unified person to be anxious. 9. 
don't accept emotional thrills as genuine happiness. 10. Regardless of exterior disorder, you can be inwardly carefree. 